Hey, what's up, YouTube? <laughs> I'm not recording it. You know, I always have to come on here and talk to YouTube first. Um, I did just post, if you go to our Instagram, I gave a crew love shout out to one of our crew members, Maxi E. Norman. She sent me this really dope daily affirmations for healing the soul book. It's called All of My Broken Crayon Still Color. And it's a journal as well. It's really cool how she, um, how she did it. It's a journal in the back. And then you have the affirmations in the front. And I really like the concept of the title because it's kind of like, even though we can be broken, we can still make change. We can still do things. And she gives these daily affirmations. So go to our Instagram. The link is there. Um, I posted about it at the Crew Book Club on IG. And um, yeah, um, follow her, buy her journal, support the crew, okay? So that's some crew love. I'm going to hop on and record on the pod on the podcast in five, four, three, two, one, and go. <laughs> what up, crew? What's good? It's your girl, Sade. Yes, I am excited to get into it with you. And, oh, see y'all? This is what YouTube get. Y'all get the special stuff. <laughs> I realize I wasn't happy. That's not how I wanted it to come in. Anywho, all right, all right, all right. You know, I'm my own producer. I do everything. Humble beginnings. All right, all right, all right. What up, crew? What's good? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Crew Book Club podcast. Yo, I am always excited to come on here and record with you guys. Like I said multiple times, this is the highlight of my week coming in diving in with the crew you know so i just i just i just love it y'all probably gonna get tired of me opening up the show like that but let me tell y'all i will be completely honest when it's one of those days um but typically if it's one of those days where i'm kind of like oh i gotta record by the time i get on here to record i'm on 10 and i'm ready to go um to hang out with you guys so as you know, I like to start every episode with asking you all, how are you really feeling? And I want you to keep it real with yourself because like I've always said, if you don't keep it real with yourself, who are you going to keep it real with, boo? So keep it funky with yourself because I'm going to keep it funky with you because I'll tell you the truth. Listen, today is just not today. <laughs> So, um, either way, I have a scripture for you, and you know it comes to the segment, who gonna check me, boo? And let me tell y'all, who is always checking me? God is, sis, God is always checking me. But you know what? I welcome him checking me, because I want to be checked. I want to get to the next level. I want to do what he wants me to do. And at times, we need to get checked. That just shows love, you know what I'm saying? That shows that he really loves me when he can check me, so... I appreciate the checks. This scripture, check this, um, who gonna check me scripture comes from the devotional journal, Believe Bigger. It's from day 24. I read this about two weeks ago, but it resonated with how I was feeling. And I actually just had the conversation the other day with a friend of mine. And it made me think of this, this passage. It comes, the scripture comes from Psalms 139, verse 14. It says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know full well. And some of the highlights in the passage for, for us from the author, Marshawn Evans, um, Daniels, it reads, when we obsess about what others are doing, we make room for doubt to creep in. Like, you're not doing enough. You're behind. It's too late. You're not as talented. Your life isn't as pretty. You don't have enough. You just aren't enough. Much of our insecurities come from our addiction to comparison and trying to keep up with what others seem to be doing and accomplishing. And... Com um, comparison cripples our confidence and compromises our, our calling. Comparison cripples our confidence and compromise our calling. There's a whole passage, but I really took out the key points that stuck out. Um, 
And this was kind of like, we have to stop comparing ourselves to people because it causes you to get distracted. Comparison is distraction and you, we should just stay far away from that. And the prayer on the other page, it says, Lord, give me eyes to see. Seize and savor the wonderfulness you're doing in my life. Remove all envy. Give me the type of focus and discipline that invites your next level provision and direction. Make me a faith leaper, not a looker. Basically, oh, amen. <laughs> Basically, mind your business, okay? Stop being nosy. Touch your own nose. And you need to focus and be disciplined on what you need to do. One of the things that, one of the examples I'll always give is Riri. Um, think about if she said, there's so many um, makeup companies and skin companies. I don't need to do this. Uh, yeah, right. Look, look at it. Like, yeah, the market was saturated, but she came in and was killing it. I mean, she knocking out Victoria's Secret. You know what I'm saying? Like she opened up her own stores. But imagine if she said, oh, everybody's doing this. Uh, No, she minds her own business, had her own provision and focused on what she needs to do. And she's killing it. And you might be thinking, yeah, but that's Rihanna. I'm not Rihanna. I want you to stop right there because that's your problem. That is your problem. You just did what I said you shouldn't do. Like, you so, like, no, you need to think of yourself bigger. You need to think bigger and believe bigger. Like, you gotta stop and realize, like, yes, you can be as big as Rihanna if you really put your mind to it and you really put your work to, um, put your, put action behind your work, you could be. Like, God can give you just as much or more but another thing you cannot do is even if you don't get to that level still getting to better could be at a different level you know what i'm saying if that makes sense it's kind of like you may not get to uh multi-million dollar status but you might get to a couple hundred thousand dollars a year babe that's still good I think society has got us so messed up and thinking, oh, if I'm not making a million dollars, I ain't doing nothing. Girl, bye. <laughs> give me, give me 200, 300K. Shoot, hell, 100K a year. That's a comfortable, that's comfortable living. You know what I'm saying? Uh, also, depending on what, uh, what area you live in, you know, I, I, I live out of Florida, so 100K in Florida can get you a long way. I mean, I don't know how long that's gonna last but I'll take it. <laughs> okay, so that was the scripture of the week, chapter, um, Psalms 139, verse 14. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Okay, y'all, I need y'all to go out here and walk in confidence because you are a big deal, sis. Okay, so let's get into the book, and I have to put a disclaimer out. The F-bomb may be dropped in the reference of the book. This is not I just don't go around dropping the F-bomb, y'all. You know, this comes from our book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. And this book has been really good. It, I, I understand why people say, okay, you definitely need to read this book. I highly rec recommend reading this book, whether it's now or later. But if you in your 20s, listen to it, like, read it. Because I think in our 20s, we care too much fucks about stuff that really didn't matter. <laughs> For me, it kind of really changed. When I when I hit 30, I really stopped caring. I really stopped giving a fuck about certain stuff. Um, but anywho, we'll be getting to chapter 6. You're wrong about everything, but so am I. And chapter 7, failure is the way forward. You know, being a miss know-it-all is not cute at all. And uh, failure... I'm sorry, y'all. Back up. Being a Miss Know-It-All is not cute. It's actually quite vexing. And anyone that is successful will tell you they have plenty of failure to get where they are today. So, yeah, don't be a Miss Know-It-All because that's annoying. And everybody fails. And if you're not failing, that means you ain't doing nothing. Okay? So, in Chapter 6, you're wrong about everything, but so am I. You ever meet someone and... They always have an answer for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It can be difficult for people to say, I don't know. That's okay to say, I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I literally Googled why people can't say no. And most of the responses said, because people fear looking like they are not intelligent. Yes. I don't know about you, but I'd rather um, someone say, I don't know, than to fake it. And let me just say this, FYI, people can tell. People know when you don't know. And you actually make yourself look even crazier when you still try to act like you know. Just save yourself the agony and people talking about <laughs> and people talking about you like, man, she don't even know what she's talking about. Just, I feel like it'll be being more authentic and saying I don't know is way better than faking it. It's annoying as heck when people in my face acting like they know what I'm talk they're talking about and they don't. It's okay to be quiet and to listen, okay? So I just want to say that, babe, it's okay not to know everything. If you did, you would be Jesus. <laughs> if we knew everything, we would be Jesus, okay? So anyway, I love how the author puts it on page 117. Uh, the author says, we shouldn't seek to find the ultimate right answer for ourselves, but rather we should seek to chip away at the ways that we're wrong today so that we could be a little less wrong tomorrow. And on page 19, it says, instead of looking to be right all the time, we should be looking for how we're wrong all the time because we are. Being wrong opens up the possibility of change. Being wrong brings the opportunity for growth. This is so true. You know, you, to, to become better, you have to accept that you've been wrong. It's point blank, point plain and simple as that. You have to accept that you haven't been doing things right and you have to become more self-aware or when you're wrong. So this leads to another great section in the chapter called The Dangers of Pure Certainty. And in this section, he states on page 128, he says, it's the backwards law again, which we talked about, I think in episode seven, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, the more you try to be certain about something, the more uncertain and insecure you, you will feel. Uncertainty is the root of all progress and all growth. As an old ad adage goes, the man who believes he knows everything learns nothing. We cannot learn anything without first not knowing something. The more we admit we do not know, the more opportunities we gain to learn. This opens to being wrong must exist for any real change or growth to take place. Listen, imagine what you could be missing out because you claimed you don't know. Knowing good well you don't, think of it as an act of bravery. When something comes up and you really don't know, just say, I'm going to be brave today and say, I don't know. <laughs> you know, look at it as an act of bravery. This even makes me think of how much time, how much time you could be saving. Think about a time um, you're at work or you're working with someone and you claim that you knew how to do something on a program and you didn't. You probably spend extra time trying to teach yourself and stressing yourself out on how to work a program. You could have just said, I don't know. Someone could have helped you. You would have saved all your time and energy trying to figure something out, got the help and saved a whole bunch of time. Save you and the company some time. I'm pretty sure they would have loved that, okay? Let's think about being more effective and efficient. And I think being effective and efficient sometimes is just flat out saying, I don't know. So that way you can get help. Um, and it's kind of one of those things. If you might be thinking, oh, well, they hired me to know this, that. And it's kind of like, listen, if they hired you and they fire you because you say, I don't know, and you need help, maybe that's not the place for you. Like, honestly, like, the expectation of knowing everything is actually a setup for failure to me. It's like, okay, if I don't know, or if it's kind of like, if I claim to not know, and then I, and I don't know, and I get help, that's cool, right? If I claim to not know, I don't know if I, if I said it right. 
but it, I'm trying to put it, put it plain. Um, I'm trying to put it plain for you. You, yeah, it's basically just saving that energy of like, I don't know, get the help. And then that's it. You save everybody some time and energy. And you kind of actually save yourself um, some embarrassment. But anyway, let me get back on track. Um, being less certain yourself is a skill you have to develop. And on page 135, it talks about that. On page 135, it says, Sorry, I lost track. Okay, here we go. On page 35, on 135, the author gives us more questions to ask ourselves. What if I am wrong? Okay. What if I am wrong? If you're sitting there miserable day after day, then that means you're already wrong about something major in your life. And until you're able to question yourself to find out, nothing will change. Or um, question two, what would it mean if I were wrong? You know, being able to look at it and evaluate different values without necessarily adapting them is perhaps the central skill required in changing one's own life in a meaningful way. And then you have question three. Would being wrong create a bigger or worse problem than my current problem for both myself and others? The goal here is to look at which problem is better. It's kind of like you ever find yourself getting into an argument with someone based on a what if. The example he gives in the book is about a brother who told his sister her fiance was not the one she should marry. And... <laughs> He gives you two options on how it could how he could have handled it, right? A, continue causing drama and friction within the family, complicating what should otherwise be a happy moment and damage the trust and respect he has with his sister, all because he had a hunch. Some might call it an intuition that this guy is bad for her. Or B, mistrust his own ability to determine what's right or wrong for his sister's life and remain humble. Trust her ability to make her own decisions even if he doesn't live with the results out of his love and respect for her. Listen, the truth is he would rather fuck up his relationship with his sister than consider that he might be wrong. Mm. This is why we have to be careful, y'all, giving our opinions. Even if you're right, it is really, is it really worth the relationship? It also says, he, he said he learned his lesson. I have been the asshole acting out based on my own insecurities and flawed certainties more times than I can count. Man, this puts certain things in perspective. Even when I, I mean, I can remember times where it's like, is it even worth arguing about? Like, is it even worth me saying anything or causing this disconnect based off of my, my thoughts? Like, live your life. I might have an opinion, but that doesn't always necessarily mean I need to say my opinion because this is basically a what if. Like, you might have a hunch about something, but babe, you might be wrong. <laughs> and sometimes it's just best to keep your mouth shut to not cause friction between things I mean I can give an example of like my own life and just being totally transparent and honest like I've had like I got engaged well actually I got married without nobody even knowing and my mom took it so personable but I'm like you don't pay none of my bills you don't do any of this and she had the all these opinions uh, about my husband and me based off of what. And then I had to sit back and I was like, you know what? Let me think about, I don't know what she went through to make her think of those particular things. So I had to kind of like self-reflect. But it also kind of damaged the relationship between her and my husband based off of what she thought. And her hunch and her opinions and her own insecurities 
which I feel like her own insecurities. But I'm just saying, like, it you could have just kept those things to yourself in certain aspects. Yeah, I mean, if somebody beating on you and, you know, that type of disrespect, that's, that's different because you're trying to, like, save someone. But at the end of the day, people are going to do what they want to do. And when they're ready to move forward or to back off, that's when they're going to do it. So do you really want to sacrifice being exiled or ruining your relationship based off of a what if? So yeah, I really, I really like that perspective and, um, and how he presented that and looked at that. So let's get into, that was from chapter six, you're wrong about everything, but so am I. So let's get into chapter seven, where it says failure is the way forward. I want you to think of failure as simple as he puts it on page 144. It says, if you think about a young child trying to learn to walk, that child will fall down and hurt itself hundreds of times. But at no point does that child ever stop and think, oh, I guess walking just isn't for me. I'm not good enough. <laughs> Avoiding failure is something we learn at some later point in life. I'm sure a lot of it comes from our education system, which judges rigorously based on performance and punishes those who don't do well. Uh, another large share comes from overbearing or critical parents who don't let their kids screw up on their own often enough, instead punish them for trying anything new or not preordained. And then we have all the mass media that constantly exposes us to stellar success after success while not showing us the thousands of hours of dull practice and, and that were required to achieve that success. You know, like those Instagram reels, you see all these successful people, but we bear, but people barely post what it took to get there and what they sacrificed. And then you up here quitting your job, thinking that you're going to go from um, a thousand, uh, you're going to go from whatever you was making to a multimillionaire. Uh, no, there's a lot of work. You got to put in work. As an entrepreneur, I can tell you right now, I'm the IT, I'm the HR, I'm the... I'm the bookkeeper, I'm the lawyer sometimes, making sure my paperwork together. Like, it's a lot of work that goes into that. So, yeah. Um, so, I think you have to understand that failing is something that you have to, you have to go through. And because it is so frowned upon in our society, it brings on the fear, which we discussed in our last book, but we have to befriend free, fear, befriend fear and push through it, right? So I like how he put it plain when you think of a young child. It's like, no, they're going to keep walking and they don't give up. And they end up, they end up walking and they end up running and doing other things. So think of that, think of failure as simple as that, okay? It's a really good example to reference through. You know, I love stuff that make things simple and plain, okay? So, I want to go to page 148 because when we know failure can be painful, but the author states on page 148 that, what does he say? I have it right here. Our pain often makes us stronger, more resilient, and more grounded to deny that pain is to deny our own potential. Let me read that again. And if we know failure can be painful, the author says, our pain often makes us stronger, more resilient, more grounded. To deny that pain is to deny our own potential. Remember y'all, pain is part of the process. For the sake of time, I'm going to finish chapter seven and on the next episode because it hits so many points about disappointing your parents and caregivers and I really want to dive into that with you all because it's all part of failing forward. Um, and I also want to have some hot moments, some honest, open, and transparent moments. Shout out to Michael Todd. And on the next episode, because I was a person, like I said in the last episode, I wasn't doing or moving a certain way because I didn't want to disappoint my parents. I didn't want to disappoint my husband. 
I didn't want to come off as a failure. So I really want to dive into that with y'all. But I don't want to keep y'all for too long because y'all know y'all attention span, attention span is kind of light. <laughs> so let's get into the challenge of the week. Challenge of the week goes back to page six on 119 about looking for how we are wrong all the time instead of right. The challenge of the week is to be wrong. Yes, the challenge of the week is to be wrong. Instead of first reaction of proving our point of being right, take a step back and see how you could be wrong. This will open up the possibility of change, become more self-aware, and you are not always right, sis. If you want to share in that I didn't moment about being wrong, like, you know what, Shade, I was wrong. And in that moment, when I thought about those questions um, on how I could be wrong, like wh when I ask those questions to myself, did it change the situation? Because a lot of time it is. I know for me, it works. Um, what if I'm wrong? What would it mean if I was wrong? Would it be wrong to create a better or worse problem than my current problem um, for both myself and the person that I'm going back and forth with? Like, is it really worth it? <laughs> I don't want to waste my energy. So yes, this week's challenge, I want you to focus on asking yourself, could it be me? Am I wrong? I'm going to take the accountability of that and I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to step back and I'm going to be wrong. And let me know how that works out for you. Check it out. Um, let us know. Check out the Instagram page as well. I always go on there to ask advice and I love to, to share how maybe the challenge of the week helped you. So go out and be wrong this week. <laughs> Listen, I love that. Let's get into what would the crew do? Ask advice. When you need advice, the crew is here to give it to you. Feel free to ask anything. That's what we're here for. I will do my best to give you the best advice. Don't be shy, y'all. This question came from the crew. What are or do you have boundaries when it comes to separating work and family? Is there like a no work phone time at home? Oh, this is good because I have real estate is nonstop. Every day is a day to sell real estate. Houses pop it up on the market. People deciding they want to sell every day. People deciding they want to buy every day. So I do have to have a cutoff. Typically, my cutoff is at 6.30. I'm not doing any work unless it's something like really dire. But generally, 6.30, I'm done. And I also this is where coming to set boundaries are important. And understanding what my values are and who I want to work with and who they align with. Now, in a first initial conversation about whenever I'm meeting someone about real estate or, what, or whatever, I am up front. And I am honest that, listen, I have a cutoff time at 630 because I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I need family time. And a lot of times people are understanding because they have family and a lot of them find it admirable. And if you don't want to work with me because I want to spend time with my family, that's your problem. I'm learning the bag is not as important as my family. And accepting that. Now, I'm sure there will, there's times where I can't always honor the 630, but I definitely try to put it on a hard line. And when you're open and honest with tra and transparent with people about that in the beginning, they typically work with you. And that's with anything. Um, I remember working for Nordstrom and I remember going into my job interview and I was like, I can only work these days and that day and I need weekends off. But because I had good rapport and a good resume, and when I showed up to work, I killed it, they did it. And that's why I'm telling people, like, to get what you want, you got to kill it. And a lot of times when you do that, you can ask for whatever because they know you put in your work. You can't be a bum, lazy, cutting corners, and not fulfilling your duties and expecting people to give you lenience. Like, come on, check yourself. So yes, that's how I set boundaries. It's just being open and honest with transparent with people that I work with. And a lot of times my clients respect it. I also pray to God that he sends me people that aligns with my values as well. 
So that goes back to the challenge of the week. If you're not sure what your values align, then check that first and then you can start setting boundaries. So yes, thanks for asking. I love questions like this. Keep them coming. You can always email the crew book club at gmail.com or you can DM at the crew book club on Instagram as well. I'm on fan base as well, the crew book club. So yes, check, um, check us out, ask advice and share all of your moments with us. Um, so let's get into the quote of the week. I cannot leave the episode without doing that. The quote of the week comes from our author, Mark Mason, from The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. On page 144, it says, Improvement at anything is based on thou thousands of tiny failures. And the magnitude of your success is based on how many times you failed at something. So now I want you to go out and start failing. Okay? Go out and start failing. And remember to do the challenge of the week by what? Being wrong. Ooh, we hate being wrong, but that's your challenge of the week is to be wrong. I love y'all and thanks for hanging with the Crew Book Club podcast. I will see y'all next week. Hey.